um, whether it was about looking at the liturgy and trying to figure out what that would look like, or sometimes making sure that the needs of the evolving community were met, and every few years someone would decide to, for the very first time, create a group for 20s and 30s, or lesbians, or you know whatever it was. Um, because these efforts would, would, would be very, very needed and then would start and then things would quiet down or settle or the people who were in the 20s and 30s group now are in the 40s and 50s group and so there was time for a new 20s and 30s group. So these kind of moments were constantly happening. Actually, the first 20s and 30s group was the under 30 group. Indeed. And then that group turned into the 30s and didn't want a different group so we had to move the under, thir under, to under 30s group to a 20s and 30s group. <laughs> First one. That was with Ian and Daniel. That was when they were in their 20s. They were part of starting that, but then we had to keep changing the number, and then when they hit 40s, we said, okay, you're gone. Uh, <laughs> but those moments were always significant because there's the desire to be in the full community, and then the desire to be among people who are like you, and how to balance these, um, these sometimes competing, but actually in some ways deeply com complementary needs of, of wanting to be among people who are in the same stage or have very specifically the same interests and also wanting to be part of a larger community. One of the most um, significant and challenging transitions in the synagogue was the transition to having a, a, a much larger presence of families with children. Um, and this was a function both of changing times that as technology and law was catching up, it became First of all, possible for LGBT people to come out and keep their children, not lose their children in horrible, painful custody battles as many people had endured. It was possible for people to choose to become parents as openly LGBT people. Choices that hadn't been available to previous generations. Choices that were hard to watch for people who were of previous generations who had made very, very painful determinations in various directions when they decided to come out. And that was a real transition point. And uh, when it, it, it shifted from there being a few people who had children to many, many more people who had children, uh, the community really had to grow around it and get used to it and also acknowledge the very real pain and celebrate the, the, the beautiful development. So we're going to invite Rabbi Weiss to read a little bit about um, that reality. So I spent much of my two years as a Cooper Burbert Master of the sitting on the floor with an Elmo puppet on my hand, <laughs> <laughs> singing and uh, leading Shabbat services. One thing I love about CBST families with young children is that you can never assume which child goes with which parent, a true embodiment of the concept that love makes a family and that biology isn't necessarily relevant. Children join families at CBST in all different ways, at birth, in childhood, through adoption, surrogacy, alternative insemination, in vitro fertilization, foster care, and beyond. Our kids and our parents are of all sorts of races, ethnicities, cultures, sexual orientations, and gender identities. Families with young children experience Judaism at CBST like many other toddlers and school kids, learning rituals, prayers, bim bam, and the dinosaur song. But they also experience community in a profoundly necessary way. For many of our kids, my own included, in their secular school classes, they're the only one with a family that looks like theirs. At CBST, we're explicit. Avinu Malkenu means that we teach that God is like our parent. What kind of parents do you have? A mommy and an ima, an abba and a tata, mommy and mama, one mom, three parents. There are other families that look like yours here, and that is kadosh. And that is the way that we are created with Salam Elohim. And we also see that the next generation of kids and their assumptions. One preschooler asks another, what do you call your moms? She responds, well, I call my dads, Abba and Tata. <laughs> we model all different kinds of families and we teach Torah through a lens that is both diverse and queer. Moses has two mommies? Absolutely. Just read the Bible. <laughs> Would you say something about uh, the social j action? Some of us have seen it, but that the banner in particular. Um, we just recently lost our CBSD banner at the last. What? You know what happened. We'll make another one. Don't worry. 
Not, don't worry, just at the last thing in the social, so we're always making new banners, but CBS has a great history of banners. Uh, at the Salute to Israel Day Parade, we lost the banner. It happens. Uh, it isn't like the AIDS, the AIDS quilt, which we lost. Oh, that's not so good. The original AIDS quilt that CBST made, uh, we had a whole AIDS quilt. The, um, the Names Project threw it out by mistake. Oh, wow. There's a lot of pain in the history of CBST. All of this is part of, it's part of life. We sent, you know, we sent our quilt to be part of when they were uh, on the mall in Washington and packing it up. Somehow they threw it out by mistake. So we made another AIDS quilt, and that's what we currently hangs at CBSD in CBSD Sanctuary every Friday night. But we also thankfully have photographs of the original quilt. It's in there. Um, and that's the in original, so the original well. photograph. So, so you know, we're able to document things even past, um, past their existence on this earth, which is important. So, um, so CBSC has always been very involved in social justice work and has wanted to be present as a synagogue community in larger expressions of protest and celebration in the life of the city. And um, something that, that was very interesting to me when I was doing the research on the book is you know, thinking about when CBSC was founded in 1973, which was really a, a counterculture moment in Jewish community. It was a time where a lot of people were questioning this, the structure of synagogue and why it was necessary to have these formal institutions. And, um, you know, the Chavura movement was starting. The, the idea of everything could be self-led and self-started and very informal. The founders of CBST wanted to create a synagogue. It was incredibly important to create a, an institution, a recognized Jewish institution that looked like a synagogue, that had a board, that had all of the things that synagogues were supposed to have, and to participate in Jewish life the way that synagogues did. And in the 70s, one of the biggest issues in the, the life of North American Jews was the struggle for Soviet Jewry. And um, you know, many people in this room, I say a lot of heads nodding, uh, you know, went to these huge marches for Soviet Jewry, and CBST wanted to do that too, and to be a present a presence as well. But as we said, many of the members in the early days were completely closeted in their lives outside of CBST. And many people were very much involved in the institutions of Jewish life beyond CBST, were active in UJA Federation, were Jewish professionals in Jewish organizations. And so how could they be present as part of their synagogue and not out themselves? So this is a pre-internet world, right? You can't Google anything, you know, the jig is up and everybody knows what CBST is. Congregation based in Katara, who knows what that is? It could be some little shtigal downtown. Nobody had to know. So they created a banner that had one section on top that said Congregation based in Katara. And the bottom said the gay synagogue. And that zipped off. <laughs> so it's a pride. They marched with the whole banner, saying who they were. But for Soviet jury marches, they unzipped the part that said gay Seca. And so they could be there as CBST together with their So community. it's genius that you found these two photographs. It's not like these photographs existed together ever before. We, I have never seen this. And so now we have in this book these two photographs, one on top of the other, one which shows the banner with both sections and the other with the zipped off gay synagogue uh, removed from Which was, participation. Which by the way, very helpful for the forensic archival research. Because if you're looking at, you know, every, every march looks the same. So then you have to look closely. Is this the zipped? <laughs> page, page 247 for anybody who has a book in front of you. Um, so you know, one of these, the other marchers also give it away a little bit. Okay. In terms of which but it's one of the right. very special yeah. things about yeah. this book. To have these two pictures side by side sums up so much about queer history in the Jewish community and the struggle to belong and the struggle for identity and how complex those things are. And the compromises people made when they didn't want to have to give up either. They didn't want to give up being part of the larger Jewish world. That was not negotiable. But being with their CBST community was also not negotiable. And so people got creative. And again, it feels so different, thank God, from the way that we live now. But that was the reality and they figured out how to do it. And yet, I just spoke to somebody last week who said this Pride is going to be his first time marching down Fifth Avenue. 
and he's so both excited and anxious and has is just it's so while we as a community can be visible and and he told he talked to me about watch it will be, he had been, he's gone to the parade for several years been on the um, the sidelines watching which he said took him a lot of effort to do even that and watching us go down this year he's going to join CBST and he's you know heart is shaking about it and he's excited so it's a it's an amazing we sometimes forget that and we have a member uh, the Wolf family you want to tell that story about their seeing us they're not in the book though we didn't tell that story that story is in the book but there, there are a few different um, stories of people who discovered the synagogue watching the pride march from the sidelines and saw the float and heard, hey, synagogue, what's going on? What is that? I need to learn more about that. And that was how they connected. That was the way in. Um, but the reason that we tell so many of these stories in different ways, and I think that the How I Got to CBST feature really tells that, because that story of first coming to CBST is so personal and is so about the, the individual moment of coming out. And so Yehuda's story in 1973 is extremely similar to Yolanda Podazinski's story in 1988. It's extremely similar to someone else's story in the, in the 90s and someone else's story this year because for that person coming out in that moment is the moment. And in fact, one fabulous way to read the book is to flip through the pages and just read all the How I Got to CBSTs in a row. Just read those boom, 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 and it becomes this amazing pastiche of stories of that moment. Uh, or you could do the same thing with reading all of the rabbinical interns, what I forgot that's called, Reflections on a Year, something like that. So I want to say a word about music at CBST and then um, ask, uh, we have a couple of people who are connected to the music, uh, besides Larry, um, uh, Eileen and Asaf, to read your, your contributions to the book. When I first came to C CBST, I can now say this publicly, uh, I of course couldn't say this for many years, I was horrified by the music at CBST. Uh, I wasn't horrified by the energy of those davening. I found that very deeply moving. But it was the, all the music that was done at CBST was basically frozen uh, 1957 conservative Judaism. And it makes a lot of sense. It's because everybody who was active in the synagogue, that's what their Judaism was. They created, they, many of them had to leave Judaism for the 60s basically. And reemerge in CBSD was the first thing many gay people who were Jewish were now doing as Jews. And so they were creating, going back to the only thing they knew, which was 1950s conservative Judaism, and that was the music of CBSD. And I knew what was possible. I knew we were in New York City. It was 1992 when I came, and I knew the quality. Yep, we're, we're, we're wrapping up. We're getting the sign. So, Anyway, so that uh, everybody knows, 1994, I begged Joyce to come in small ways to CBST. I actually had a chorus at my installation just to kind of put it in people's minds what might be possible without saying anything, just modeling it. And then from 1994, we've been really working on transforming the music at CBST. So we'd like to ask Eileen Block and Asaf. Eileen, you read first. Uh, when Joyce first talked to me about joining the chorus, I was flattered but petrified. I had never sung in a chorus before, and I didn't think I could keep up. As it turned out, singing in the chorus was and continues to be transformative for me. Joyce has taught me so much about music and singing in general, and Jewish music in particular. This has given me the confidence to expand and deepen my participation as a leader in Shabbat services. For me, music is the most direct path to the transcendent. There are times when I feel as well as hear the harmonies and the blending of voices into one sound as a truly religious experience. I am so grateful to Joyce and my fellow chorus members for the opportunity to make joyous, meaningful music together. how I got to CBST. I went to a 20-something group at the center, the Gay Center, where I met Robert Epstein, who told me about CBST. The first time I went to a service, the room was packed. It was like nothing I'd ever been to before. I didn't grow up religious, but I liked all the singing. That's what made me feel at home. 
We used to sit in the back row. They called us the boys in the back. <laughs> Robert, Daniel Chesser, and Ian Turan, and others. Pretty quickly, that was what I was doing every Friday night. There were other people like me and other young people. It was a community, a way of feeling Jewish and accepted and welcomed. Daniel and Ian asked me to sing one of the Sheva Bachot at their wedding. After the wedding, Rabbi Kleinbaum said, you should join the chorus. I wasn't interested. The chorus was just getting started, and they were mostly singing in unison. Rabbi Kleinbaum hounded me week after week until I finally spoke to Joyce. I joined the chorus. It was an amazing experience. I said to myself, what was I thinking that I didn't want to do this? They held classes for people who wanted to become lay service leaders. At first, it didn't even occur to me that I could do that. I was very scared of public speaking and of being on stage. So the chorus helped me a lot in terms of gaining confidence. To be up there and lead congregants in prayer, I felt people were with me. It was a real kavod. All my great friends who played such a central role in my life came from CBST. I am so thrilled. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the readers and for everyone who came tonight. Um, and, I, and I got um, very happy news while we were having this event that the display downstairs, the interactive um, show, is going to actually be kept for all, yeah, all throughout um, till the end of June. Because it's so pretty. So I really invite you all to go and, and check it out and, and have uh, and have some wine with us um, just when we're going to um, uh, come to a close here. And uh, yes, and we're going to open the floor for questions and, and some Q&A. But first of all, I want to say something and I want to and I want to ask one question. I'll, I'll get to ask the first question. So um, I, I, I have to say, um, the first place I came to when I first came yeah. to New York City was CBSD. So just a few days after I arrived, I went to Friday night services and I immediately felt welcomed and I actually made my first friend there. So I was just, I didn't know how to go. That's where I went. And I want to also say it was quite a, a leap for me to attend a service like that because I I come, I come from Israel, I come from Sephardi the Mizrahi house, my dad does the uh, Kiddush differently, and so um, it's, it's, it's something that I, that I definitely had to get used to. And I want to ask, um, what are the challenges for you in terms of diversity inside the community? Because I know that a lot of people come from very, very different backgrounds, and every person wants to feel like, this is my home, we're doing it just the same way that we did it in my house, um, and especially if there's a situation of a person needing to be homeless for some reason. And so, if you could talk a little bit about these challenging uh, challenges of um, being inclusive to diverse people from diverse backgrounds, um, whether it's Jews of color, Sephardi, Mizrahi, or um, Jews who are, who have converted, or other other people as well. Um, yeah, please. I, I often say that people think CBSD must be such a simple place because it's you know was founded uh, to bring together homosexuals, um, but we're actually extremely heterogeneous um, in many different categories. And whereas the homo part might have been about sexuality, it's not about any other part of us. And in fact, other synagogues which are not homosexual are almost much more monolithic and much more homo than us. Uh, because we've got the homo for the sexual part, perhaps, but the hetero for... Um, okay, I'll drop that. But, but I would add to that, so CBSC is very diverse in terms of people come from... Uh, religious and non-religious backgrounds, from Zionist, very Israel-focused, to very anti-Zionist and not Israel-focused, from uh, Jews who have grown up in socioeconomically uh, very wealthy uh, categories, to extru we have people who, we have congregants who live in homeless shelters and have to leave services early enough on Friday night because the shelter has a curfew. 
So that kind of economic diversity doesn't exist in many synagogues either. So we have lots of different diversities that we really love, and we've been pushed on all different ones in, in different times. Um, and in particular, the issue that you raise about Sephardi and Mizrahi is something we're very interested in. We've had different kinds of Jews in the synagogue in, um, uh, in numbers that are now beginning to really percolate in really interesting ways. We have for many years had a Moroccan Shabbat. But Joyce, well, when uh, Rabbi Cohen and I and Joyce were working on the Sidur, for instance, we wanted to make sure the Sidur would have Ladino in it as well as Yiddish. And we have a paragraph explaining Ladino in the Sidur, and we have a paragraph explaining Yiddish in the Sidur. That we wanted both to be there, and we try very hard in services, not just on Moroccan and Shabbat, but throughout the year to have in services some of that. We have to, this coming year, in fact, we're doing a Shabbaton, which you're going to be involved in, as some know, but nobody in the synagogue knows. We're going to be doing an in-city Shabbaton that's going to be exploring and working with uh, Miz, uh, queer Mizrahi community here in New York, and it's going to be a celebration of Mizrahi Sephardi Jewish culture. And we have now, we're now, we have Persian Jews in the congregation, we have Syrian Jews in the congregation, we have Iraqi and Turkish Jews in the congregation, and Moroccan. So just a word about how that's reflected in the book. Um, there, there's a, a chapter which is all about, uh, it's called Enlarging the Tent, all about the different communities within the synagogue and, and the different efforts to create committees around different organizing principles that shift, you know, at any given point based on who wants to take the initiative when there's a critical mass. And so there have been at various times groups for, uh, for, for Russians, for Mizrahim, for, um, you know, so, so Jews from different ethnic origins. By the way, the, the um, person that, that many people consider the founder of the synagogue, Jacob Gabe, who's the first person to put that ad in The Voice, was a Jew from India. Unfortunately, he didn't know anything about Judaism, so he wasn't <laughs> able to bring out those yeah. traditions. But it, I think it's actually an important piece to uh, when we're telling really the story. Hated women. That was the other thing. He really hated women. <laughs> but, 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 we're complicated to a congregation. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Let me. Yeah, you stop asking and I'll bring them up. Please. Me? Okay. Yes. A couple of things. Number one. Uh, there was a rabbi who said that... Do you mind standing up and just be a little closer? Okay. Do you mind? There, were, uh, oh, okay. there was a rabbi who, who said there are Jews who uh, uh, believe in one God or less. Uh, and that they're lo Which really means that there are those who are atheists who, who want to be combined with everyone, and they do that as well. So I, I didn't hear you uh, talking about that aspect. And also, there's a... We've seen as well that there are African American Jews as well, and that hasn't been discussed yet either. Ah, uh, yes. There's so many things we couldn't uh, we couldn't uh, get it, squeeze into even as long as we talked. There are many things we didn't touch. But yes, and we have African American uh, members of the congregation, and we're delighted to announce that uh, one of our Cooper Berger Nestor Medical interns next year is an African American lesbian uh, student, a rabbinical student at uh, the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, and she's. Start tomorrow is her orientation, and she'll uh, be at the synagogue tomorrow. And she is a Jew by choice and uh, an African American lesbian with three teenage kids. And she was really, really excited about her participation. Um, but yes, and we are, yes, we have African American members of the congregation. Um, and in fact, I, uh, well, we don't have time for that whole story. Uh, what was your other question? Atheists, yes. Well, we, as I said, we have people of all different religious backgrounds, including um, uh, complete hostility to God, which is as Jewish as it gets. And, and I would say that's that's the that's the foundation of Jewish uh, theology. So, CB, and I, by the way, that in that way, I don't think CBST is unique. I think that's you know it was across the board. Um, and I always say, and I've said it from the Bima on Yom Kippur that you know, I believe in God, but I do not believe in a God who cares about whether or not I believe in God. If that, what? That we believe. That you, yeah, and I certainly don't believe in a God that cares whether I believe in God or whether anybody else believes in God. I wouldn't believe in that kind of God. That kind of God is gonna be a totally petty, you know, narcissist. God does not need us to believe in God, that's my, so I, anybody who doesn't believe in God is totally welcome. 
<laughs> but I make that more clear in other settings, but absolutely. <laughs> Any more questions? Or comments? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you have to go back to the Regarding the people, regarding the people who requested anonymity, is that in perpetuity, or is that after they die, they don't care if they're? Wow, we didn't discuss that. <laughs> but again, there's only one. There's only one person who has a pseudonym in the book, and um, his wishes are are clear. We have not. We haven't. That's, I think that we still do forever. By the way, we should also say that while nobody else resisted being in the book or giving permissions, even people who hate me and who hate the synagogue. <laughs> I mean, one of the reasons we had to really make sure, so everybody who's pictured or mentioned in the book signed a release, um, and, and that's why Tasha did this huge, huge job to do this. Um, it was really important to, to do that, partly because there is still a libel law on the New York State. This books. is unbelievable. It's still, you can sue someone for libel if they call you gay. In print. In print. And so we had to get permission for anybody who's pictured. We very, very careful that everybody who was pictured or mentioned um, was agreeing to that. And people were extremely quick and extremely happy to sign the releases and to know that they were going to be included. Everybody wanted to be in the book. Nobody said, don't put me in the book just because I hate Kleinbaum or I hate CBST. And there are people who are in the book who have left the synagogue. We have, okay. yeah, time for one last question. Actually, it's a With all the documentation and all of the, the vast amount of materials that you found, I'm actually wondering, were there any gaps in the materials? Was there stuff that you didn't find that you really regret not being able to enjoy the book? That's a really good question. Um, there were definitely periods where we were very low on photographs, and um, like the 80s as a decade was very sparse. Um, and so, and you can see that, kind of if the photographic quality is, is low of the photos are there, either it's because we had very little to choose from, or I begged Marsha and Susan to let me put in a poor photograph because I felt like it told a good story. Mm -hmm. um, but that period, the 80s, in fact, when Rabbi Cohen and I, were you at the program at RRC that we did? Um, there's a member of the RRC community who's a rabbi at RRC, um, who was a very active member on the, at CBST in the late 80s. And as soon as you finished speaking, it was Alan Payover, he said, you know, nothing from my years are in the book, you know, and it was that, that period, and it's precisely because that's a very, uh, that period we don't have any photographs. And I should have said, you know, part of what we did is we sent out multiple calls to the community asking people to send in their photographs, their archival materials, because we wanted to collect things that we didn't necessarily have. And so some people came forward and it was extremely helpful. Unfortunately, you know, there, there definitely were some things we weren't able to And the other thing is lots and lots of the photographs we had were from the Gay Pride March or Purim. And yeah. so we had this, we have an imbalance of what, and in fact, from doing this, that's why we now hire or ask photographers to come to more and more CBSD events. So we'll have other things recorded besides Purim and the Gay Pride March. <laughs> And we have this I just wanted to comment that given the fact that there was a paucity of photographs, there were in gaps, there still managed to be a total of 501 illustrations and photographs throughout the book. Yes. Okay. Um, join us for a little more socializing. So if you walk down the stairs, make a right into the great hall, you'll see the wine and the display. And stay with us for a little more to chat. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, and of course, if anyone wants to buy a book, you can purchase them downstairs. Follow us up. Follow, follow us up. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you.
pisado yo su cartel. Yeah. Uh, 